We're back in Puglia in southern Italy to check up on a project we visited nearly a year ago at the first fixed stage. Now for once it's raining so we're going to go in and see what's been happening. Now the last time we we're here there was flexible conduit absolutely everywhere on this project all through the floors going up walls and ending in these junction boxes or cassettes or register boxes depending on where you're watching from. Now later in the video we'll do a big reveal We'll take the cover off and see how they've managed to tackle all those different wires that go in there. And we also saw the first fixed stage of this consumer unit as well. I'm going to resist the temptation to pull the plastic film off. Instead, I think we'll take a look inside, remove the cover, find out what's going on here. So most of the circuits here seem to be on their own RCBOs. And again, because this is a TT supply, they're all double pole devices. We've got a few MCBs here that seem to be sharing a common RCD here, what we'd call a split load arrangement, but remember that's spread across three phases, so not too many circuits relying on one device. Then we've got something quite clever on this row here. So there's some lighting controls. So normally UK wiring, we have obsessions about intermediate and two-way switching, uh, which means the cabling can get a little bit complicated, particularly if you have more than two switching locations. Here we've got these little relay boxes here that are wired out to some low voltage controls. I can trigger them manually here just by pushing the buttons on here and we'll see there's a light start going on and off to test them. And there's also an interface here for the heating controls as well. So this has got air conditioning and an air source heat pump but each room seems to have its own little thermostat that's wired back to this control here and there seems to be some control comms wiring underneath that's going somewhere again back in those conduits back to probably the junction box. I like the modular plates on here. There's only one problem could go wrong is I can't necessarily remember which one goes on which row, apart from the top one, because that's obvious. I think I've got that the wrong way around. Not ventilation, that's lights. Now while we're on the subject of lighting control, there seems to be another method used in this bedroom. I've got a light position here, switch the lights on as I come in the room, and I can also switch lights off at either side of the bed. In the UK, we would have that as a two-way and intermediate and complicated wiring, especially for DIYers who stray across it. In here, I can actually hear something clicking inside this junction box, or perhaps another one. We need to take the cover off a little bit later on in the video. Now let's move on to the topic of sockets. Now, we recently put a poll out to the eFix community who unanimously voted that the British socket was the best in the world. There still seems to be disagreements when you get across to mainland Europe about what is the best socket system. Everybody just assumes that somehow the Schuko socket is the standard, but then people from Denmark weighed in, from France, they all have slight different variants. And that's at play here because we have a combination of two. We're in Italy and this is the Italian socket that comes in two current ratings. So you've got two sort of pin slots for there next to a Schuko socket. So anyone from mainland Europe, perhaps you'd like to comment about that. Why does this happen? Why can't you agree on just using one type of socket? But anyway, let's have a look under the cover to see what goes on on the wiring side. Now, I quite like the way these frames are removed because you can again, get all the decoration done so the painters can't paint on top of them. I'm sure some of them obviously do. And then you've got this mounting frame here and then the modules that actually click in place. And the back boxes are actually quite generous when it comes to the actual depth of them. Interesting, there's still screw terminals on here as well. But here's another thing. So these sockets are looped together with the wiring. But in the UK, what we'd normally do, even if it was on a radial circuit, this socket here, would be wired straight through to this one here. So only one wire coming in. So I wonder if that's the case here. Do the loop between sockets came off well, didn't it? Right, so it's the same in this socket as well. So we'll loop between them. But the actual wire from here goes individually back to that register box, which was a similar situation that we heard when we were in Tenerife with Mark last year as well, that you don't loop between sockets. Each individual item goes back to that register box and all of the connections are done there, which is quite interesting. So please comment if you do wire these up, whether you're allowed, if you're going to add an additional socket. Could I just take a conduit from here to where I want a new socket? I would have to chase up all of the floor. 
and take it back to that box. What's interesting in that socket as well, I don't know if you noticed, but the line conductor was grey, which is a phase colour. And we are on a three phase system, so that could be the natural fit for that. But then when I look at these lights here that are waiting for the final fitting to be put in place, I see a red wire. I thought we were supposed to be harmonised across Europe. We'd adopted colours that we have now, the brown, the grey and the black for phase, and yet we see red. British colours making a comeback. Also interesting, while we're here, we can see that the emergency lighting has also been added as well. Now, I think that's a great idea for residential properties in case you're obviously tripping a breaker or if you have a power cut. Now, we'll just have a quick look in this bathroom. And <gasps> shock. Sockets in a bathroom. And look how close they are to the sink. Oh, that would give us palpitations. We've got to be, I think, two and a half metres from the edge of a bath or outside of the zones. How do you get away with this? So we're in a kitchen area now, and we can see that combination of Schuko plug with the Italian plug next to it as well. And early in the video, I said the Italians might have a fetish when it comes to flexible conduit. There's two fetish that we have in the UK when it comes to electrical wiring. The first is sockets. There's only three sockets on this bench to power everything. We'd have at least four or five, and it'd all be doubles with their own switch. There is a switch here, but that's just for the under cabinet lights. The second fetish we've got in the UK is isolators. We put isolators on absolutely everything. And underneath the counter here, there is a fridge, there's a dishwasher, we've got an induction hob. So on here as well, we'd have at least three isolators or perhaps some people might have tucked them away in a cupboard. They don't do any of that here in Italy. There'll probably be a socket underneath the bench where they're just plugged into. So just before we leave this area, what do we find? It's another consumer unit or distribution board. Open it up, looks pretty similar to the one we saw earlier. Looks like we've got to gain a three-phase supply in their selection of RCBOs. Those contactors are back again. And interestingly, as you see these little DIN rail modules, they've all got little buttons on you can push. And there's always a temptation, isn't there, to just to push buttons to see what they do. And I've realized that actually, when I look closely, that's an energy actuator, which seems to be operating those contactors. Now, we've got another distribution board here, a consumer unit. So that means we've got two, which means there must be something feeding these somewhere else. Hmm, let's see where that is. Perhaps it might be sunny the next time we come here. Interesting, I'll just stop by this outdoor light. Now, how do we wire outdoor lights? We'd have armoured cables, we'd have junction boxes. The Italian way of doing it is a lot simpler. You have a flexible conduit, and that's it. Down into the cellar. Wow, now this is what I call a plant room. It certainly, uh, certainly looks like the plumbers have been having fun in there. There's a lot of pipes, a lot of valves, a lot of pumps. Now this is all linked back up to a heat pump that we're not gonna go into in this video. What we're here to see is this. Now this seems to be the hub of everything. The consumer unit or distribution board feeding everything. I think there's only one thing we need to do. Let's get the cover off to see what's going on in here. Just before we do pop this cover off, a few things we can see straight away. Here's the main switch for the whole property, and that's rated at 32 amps, which tells us our three-phase supply must be the order of about seven kilowatts per phase, which is which is not, not huge, probably similar power level to we have in the UK on single phase. Next to it, the surge protection device. So interestingly, this is a type one because we're on a TT supply and it's backed up by traditional fuses that we'd like to see those uh, traditional cartridge fuses in there. And then we can see MCBs feeding out to those other distribution boards and a lot of the kit that's in here, the heat pumps and the thousands of pumps that are in here as well. And we see auto voltaico, so solar panels. Now, one thing interesting, I'm just gonna confirm that. And here's a first, for the channel here, because after nearly 50 years on this planet, it is a big celebration this year. If anyone wants to uh, pass on their best regards, I've had to succumb to using glasses. Now, getting geeky on the RCDs, this one is a Type A, so it means it has a certain uh, way of coping with DC leakage currents, and you'd expect that on the photovoltaic panels. However, every other RCD and RCBO we've seen in this property is still the Type AC, which is, you know, again, we're supposed to be harmonized. I thought we were leaving those behind, and certainly countries like Germany moved on from them decades ago. We've just moved on from Type AC in the UK. And that's quite interesting for a few things. And what I've discovered recently is these pumps over here, take the glasses off because I can't see when I'm walking around with them, these are 
are inverter driven pumps and they create quite a bit of leakage current and specifically some DC leakage current as well. I'm surprised that these are still protected upstream by type AC RCDs but I think you'll be seeing more of that as we adopt more and more heat pumps. I think these could become a problem. The normal AC leakage current on these I found buried 53 pages in a data sheet is of the order of a few milliamps and there's five pumps here so between them that's producing quite a bit of leakage current so again that's why we ditched the split load be interesting to see what happens next on RCDs. I've, I've heard rumors that heat pumps you need to be looking at type B or F which are phenomenally expensive. Anyway we digress we'll get the cover off we can see lots of other home automation stuff in there shouldn't need the glasses anymore for the next part. Siemens box similar to how you build up a rack mounted unit I quite like that design. Wow it all looks pretty neat and tidy in here all of those cables immaculately ferruled up. Now just to get something out of the way when it comes to ferrules. Italian conduit wiring uses conductors that are termed class 5 so they have multiple fine strands of copper as part of the conductor makeup so they are pretty flexible and you probably need them to get through those flexicon pipes that are everywhere and you put a ferrule on the end because that's suitably treating them. Now UK conduit wiring and we always get criticized with this when we saw short videos that we don't typically put ferrules on the end and and that is because our conductors are classed as class 2 conductors. They only have seven individual strands of copper as part of that conductor makeup. So they're just not as flexible. And it's generally not recommended that you put ferrules on the end of them, only in very specific applications that you've tested. So hopefully we can finally clear that up. So let's have a little look at what's going on here. We've got our main incomer here, and that feeds into this bus bar block here which we saw early in one of the other boards and I didn't realize you can actually see the neutral and then you can see the three line phases there as well so this is performing the distribution of all of those wires out to individual circuits so you don't need to loop between them to give them the supply neat way of doing that really and that gets rid of the need for a bus bar in between the devices now circuit protective conductors yes there are some there wasn't any in those earlier boards to look at now if you remember in that first video this is again TT earthing system with a ring electrode going around the entire property with those massive earth rods and that's tied back into this block here where it seems we've brought in all of the other ones from the circuit and then a chunky one out to our surge protection device there. Individual MCBs feeding out to the distribution boards that we've just seen so there's the one tucked away under the swimming pool. We've got a lot of actuators here assuming for the pumps individually wired. So here's the answer to all those contactors that we saw in the other distribution board. So if we look at the incoming supply here there are three top or current transformers fitted around the conductors and that's connected to this device here mentioned load control. So that is communicating with the other contactors in the other boards on those hydro appliances and the reason for that obviously we've got seven kilowatts per phase but by the time you factor in some induction hobs the heat pump as well you could end up in a scenario where you could exceed the rating of the incoming supply and obviously trip that out which is obviously a little, a little bit irritating because everything would go off in that situation. So the load control is looking at what the proper is using and then making some decisions to switch some of those high current appliances off to avoid tripping that incoming breaker. Just before we get the cover on this unit, Routledge's rule of enclosures has kicked in. No matter how big a board you pick, you always run out of space. That's happened here where they've had to add in an additional little board underneath to take a few more in rail modules. While we're in the plant room we might as well have a look at an Italian solar installation here. We've got a Huawei inverter that we've had a closer look at before, quite a smart bit of kit. There's no battery storage in yet but this is a hybrid inverter so it's already set up for that there with those high voltage MC4 connectors underneath there as well. Interesting because we did a video recently where we talked about DC isolators and not fitting them on solar strings because the inverter's got one built in and that tends to be the direction of travel now. I can feel it just underneath there. But interestingly, on the Italian installation, it seems there's no isolators anywhere. So there isn't even one on the AC supply here coming into it as well. And now why would there be? Because actually to isolate this, you only need to go to the board there and turn off the 
breaker there that would isolate all poles. It's a three phase inverter and I think there's about five or six kilowatts of solar up on the roof connected to this. It's interesting you can see all the flexible conduits from the various junction boxes coming in above this cable basket there that's been used to distribute the cabling around this plant room. Lots of data wires in there as well coming down into this rack mounted case here so we can see we've got a switch and a patch panel distributing out the things like CCTV cameras and the data outlets across the property including a UPS in there, recorder for the video camera system as well, and the broadband router there as well. One thing I've just noticed in here, yeah, brown flexible cable. Who in the world would spare a brown flexible cable? It's like buying a brown car. So it looks like the swimming pool is full, but it's been covered because it's winter time to stop the leaves dropping in there. But it might be interesting to check out actually what they do for the electrical works for a swimming pool, which I think is down here. So we're here in a small plant room underneath the swimming pool where it's got all the parts you'd expect for a swimming pool, pumps, lots of pipe work to keep the plumbers happy. And guess what? Another consumer unit. So let's have a quick look inside to see what we can find in here. It's an IP rated unit as you expect, IP55 that looks like on there. RCD incoming, various contactors here. Seems to be an automatic or manual for the pump. I'm sure there's some sensor in here that dictates when a pump should start. Probably tied to this timer down here as well. Starter for the pump as you'd expect. All wired in what looks like plastic conduit with singles. Combination of flexible conduit and pre-manufactured bends, something we don't really use in the UK. We'd form that with a bending spring, uh, but seems to be uh, widely used out here. Quite a neat layout, outer transformer there for some lights in the pool, and seems to be some additional sensors and level switches wide from this IP junction box there. I don't think we've got any really dangerous snakes in this country. Could be like Indiana Jones down there. Snakes, why did it have to be snakes? And now for the big reveal. What exactly does happen inside these junction boxes? We saw earlier that it looks like every socket and light switch gets individually wired back to here. And now we can see all of the wires are joined together in massive single pole terminal blocks just put in there and one big screw connecting them together, which can be kind of quite useful when it comes to fault finding if something, a socket doesn't work you'd either just disconnect it or pull in some replacement wires for that individual socket. Data cables and the coax for things like TV we can see just loops through without any connections being made back down to that switch that we saw earlier in the cellar. So essentially for them these are just drawing in points an easy way to get cables from A to B. There seems to be a similar approach inside this junction boxes here where all of the line and neutral connections are joined together in these massive single pole terminals. But if I look behind here here we can see that relay that we can hear clicking with the multiple switching positions in this room. We're getting quite another clever function for this junction box. And while we're in here, we can see obviously all the single cables that have been pulled in for the circuits and all of the data connections that just seem to be looped in and looped out. So long as a coax as well, seems to be a coax in there as well. And here's possibly the busiest junction box in the whole property directly underneath the consumer unit. By doing all the connections here, it means it keeps it nice and neat and tight tidy in the actual distribution board itself. And here's those earth conductors or circuit protective conductors that we couldn't find earlier on. They're all joined together in here. None of them actually go into the board itself, which must mean that initial testing and fault finding could be a little bit more challenging. And fault finding is something that we're going to look at in the video that's on screen now.